<laughs> Please welcome Rose Aguilar. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Hope for inviting me and putting on this amazing event. When I became vegan 20 years ago and then vegetarian, I think it was 25 years ago, I never expected to see anything like this. I mean, the changes that I have witnessed in 25 years have been nothing short of remarkable. Back then, I mean, my mom was a really good cook, but when I got out on my own, I really didn't know what to eat. There were hardly any options in restaurants. And so the changes that we're seeing are amazing. And I just want to thank all of you for doing the great work that you do to spread awareness about these really important issues. So I today want to talk about the power of the media and the power of social media to raise awareness about these issues. And I also want to talk about the importance of calling out big ag by name. This is a relatively new idea, and I would like to leave a lot of room at the end of the talk so we can dialogue about this. Now, we often hear about big ag, right? I, I go to so many conferences and I hear animal ag, big ag, but we really never hear the names, Tyson, Cargill, Smithfield. I mean, how many of you are familiar with the top big ag companies? And could you tell a friend what they do? Does anyone know what Smithfield does? How much money they make? Okay, a couple people. I think that's really telling. And I did a lot of research for this. And some of the information is really hard to find because the privately owned companies keep a very tight lid on what they do. But I'm a good researcher, so I found a lot. So the idea for this came when I hosted my show. I host so many shows about the environment and climate change. And the one disturbing pattern I find is that the guests hardly ever talk about animal ag or big ag. These are some of the most prominent environmentalists you can think of, and they don't talk about big ag. Now, I don't want to name names because sometimes these conversations are off the record. But I will say that many scientists have told me that they don't want to take on the industry because it's too powerful. They have been bullied. Uh, one woman told me that she did take on the industry, not very harshly. And when she went to a conference, they came after her publicly. So if you're working for an organization and you're making money and you have kids to feed, are you really going to rock the boat, right? That's a big, big problem. One environmentalist I met recently who is actually vegan, she didn't bring it up. And I said, but you're vegan. Why didn't you bring it up? And she said, well, I've heard about this thing about how much water it takes to produce beef, but the cow's pee, it goes right back into the land. And I thought, okay, can I please quote you on this? And I recently had a very prominent environmental activist on my show. And when he or she did not mention big ag, I asked him or her why. He or she said, it's complicated. And I said, can you elaborate? He or she said, well, there really isn't a specific target like there is with the oil industry. So for example, we can directly talk about BP, Chevron, Exxon, but you don't have that with the animal agricultural industry. It's very complicated. No one knows who they are. We need targets in order to feel like, for people to feel like they're going to change anything. And that's the comment that got me thinking. So again, over the years, I've been to so many events where we talk about big ag, but we don't name names. And I think we need to start naming names. The media are so powerful. We just did a show about media consolidation on Friday. It's been 20 years since Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act. And back in 1983, 50 companies controlled 90% of the media, and now it's just six. Now, when you think about those companies, think about the commercials. It's all of the food, the processed food, the chickens, the turkeys. So that's why they don't talk about this, because they're making so much money off the advertising. So you have to connect the dots. Now, these issues are getting more attention because people are talking about the connections between our diet and the environment. But what I'm afraid of is that the animals are getting lost in this conversation. So I see a lot of memes on Facebook, a lot of graphics about how much water the average diet uses, how much water does it take to produce a pound of beef. This is horrible for the planet and it's horrible for climate change. And I think, but what about those cows? I just feel like the animals are really missing from that conversation. I'm so glad it's happening. But I think it's also important to reiterate the fact that more than 9 billion, B, billion land animals die every year in the United States alone. Globally, that number exceeds 70 
70 billion. That's more than 6 million animals every hour. And based on a lot of the reading that I've done, the demand overseas is exploding because people are making more money and they're demanding more meat and more dairy. And we'll talk about that today. And then the number of fish killed, and we heard that in the last talk, is far greater. It's just massive. By the year 2050, there are projections that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. You can look this up. It got a lot of media attention. All right, so let's talk about some of these big ag companies. I want to begin with Tyson Foods. This is one of the largest poultry and red meat producers in the world. And Tyson Foods, according to reports, has 123 food processing plants. According to its own website, Tyson kills and processes an average of 41 million chickens, 133,000 cows, and 383,000 pigs every week. I get the chills thinking about this. I had to read these numbers multiple times because I could not and I still cannot wrap my head around this. So again, every week, 41 million chickens, 133,000 cows, and 383,000 pigs. Now, what we're seeing is major consolidation in all industries, but also in the food industry. So Tyson owns Jimmy Dean, Hillshire Farm, Sarah Lee, Ballpark, Wright, Adels, and State Fair. Its prepared foods include bacon, sausage, turkey, lunch meat, hot dogs, pizza crusts, toppings, tortillas, and desserts. So these companies are in the business of providing lots and lots of different kinds of foods. Restaurants served by Tyson include McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, Chick-fil-A, and Popeyes. Tyson has 113,000 employees at more than 400 facilities around the world. Now, this is why I thought about Tyson first, and when this environmental activist told me that you can't name, na name names, a report from Environment America came out, and I said, ha ha, here's the name. This report found that between 2010 and 2014, Tyson Foods and its subsidiaries released 104 million pounds of pollution into U.S. waters. That is seven times the volume of surface water discharged by Exxon, Dow Chemical, and Coke Industries over that time. So that's not to say that we should give them a pass, but Tyson should be a household name just as Exxon is. So ask yourself, why isn't it? Maybe this is just the beginning of something that we really need to talk about. I just think that big ag is too vague, and I feel like the industry loves it when we say big ag because there's no target. Yes, so you can find this report at Environment America. It found between 2010 and 2014, Tyson and its subsidiaries released 104 million pounds of pollution into U.S. waters. So we're talking rivers, waters. That's seven times the volume of water, surface water discharged, pollution discharged by Exxon, Dow Chemical, and Coke Industries during that same period. So Tyson Foods came in at number two behind AK Steel Holdings Corporation. I'd never heard of this before, but that's number one. It's an American steel company. So Tyson's pollution footprint includes manure from its growers' factory farm operations, fertilizer runoff from grain grown to feed the livestock, and then waste from its processing plants. John Rumpler is a senior attorney with Environment America, and he recently told Think Progress, quote, in the public's mind, if you were to ask who are the big polluters, they would say Exxon, Dow, and DuPont. I think most people who go to the supermarket to buy chicken do not realize what Tyson is, heads and shoulders above some of the, these well-known polluter names, end quote. So again, I really think if you're active on social media, and we'll talk more about that later, but Tyson, these names really need to start coming out rather than big ag. Okay, so what about the animals? Multiple undercover investigations by Mercy for Animals into Tyson Foods have exposed horrific cruelty. I'm sure you've seen these videos. Birds bred to grow so fast they become crippled, workers violently punching them, birds having their heads ripped off. Now, a lot of people don't know this. Tyson Foods chickens are bred to grow so fast that they become crippled under their own weight and they die in agony. So in 1925, a 112-day-old chicken weighed two and a half pounds. Okay, that was in 1925. Today, a 48-day-old chicken weighs six pounds. 
According to Mercy for Animals, these chickens are unable to walk. They often die of dehydration because they can't get to the water. They can't walk to the water. Others die from heart attacks, organ failure, and other problems related to this rapid growth. High levels of ammonia due to the filthy factory farm conditions also lead to skin and throat irritations and deadly respiratory problems. So Mercy for Animals reports, and this should be widely reported, but it's not, there are no federal laws to protect chickens during their lives on factory farms. And most states specifically exclude chickens from anti-cruelty laws. And you'll learn why in just a minute. So this means that Tyson is able to routinely get away with torturing chickens. And if the average person on the street sees these videos, they are utterly disgusted. In the first quarter of this year, Tyson brought in $9 billion in revenue. In 2014, it bought Jimmy Dean, sausage maker, Hillshire Brands for almost $8 billion. The company expects sales to reach $37 billion this year alone. In 2014, Tyson's CEO, Donnie Smith, made $12 million. We definitely don't hear about these CEOs. According to the National Institute on Money and State Politics, Tyson Foods has hired 78 different lobbyists over 15 years. In 2014, it spent only a million dollars on lobbying. I mean, these companies don't really spend much, and they sure get a lot in return. Now, with Citizens United, they're able to spend dark money, so we really don't know where most of the money is coming from. It gives slightly more to Republicans, but not by much, only 200000 So it gives to Republicans and Democrats. Again, I want to reiterate, for those of you that just walked in, Tyson Foods processes an average of 41 million chickens, 133,000 cows, and 383,000 pigs every single week. So number three on Environment America's water pollution list is the US Department of Defense with all of the weaponry, followed by Cargill, which loaded US waterways with 50 million pounds of toxics between 2010 and 2014. Cargill spent 1.3 million on lobbying, giving mostly to Republicans. Uh, I read that the Cargill CEO was a big George W. Bush supporter. Cargill is the country's second largest privately held business right after Coke Industries. So that means that a lot of their information is very secret. It was really hard to find this information but I cite all of it. Over the past decades, its sales have more than doubled. I got a lot of the sales information from the Wall Street Journal. Cargill is the largest supplier of grains in the world, the world's second largest supplier of animal feed, the second largest turkey processor, and the second largest meat packer in the United States right after Tyson. According to Fortune Magazine, Cargill's facilities can slaughter more cattle than anyone else's in the United States. And like many multinationals, Cargill owns several brands, Good Nature All Natural Pork, we're going to have a humane, the myth of humane talk later, I hope you can stay for that, Sunny Fresh Egg Products, Honeysuckle White Turkey, Sterling Silver Premium Meats, Wilbur Chocolates, Neutrina Dog Food, and Diamond Crystal Salt, just to name a few. In the last quarter, Cargill's revenues were $25 billion. According to SourceWatch, like I said, Cargill goes to great lengths to keep a lot of this information private. So that one's short. I couldn't find that much information on Cargill, but I'm going to continue searching. Okay, and then there is Smithfield. Smithfield is the world's largest pig producer and processor. Smithfield kills 80,300 pigs and 7,850 cattle every day. 80,300 pigs a day. They have 2,700 pig farms in 12 states. In 2014, Smithfield CEO Larry Pope's total compensation package was $37.5 million. Smithfield's recent revenue totals were $3.9 billion. But according to reports, some of the sales are falling. A lot of this has to do with the drought. In 2013, this is fascinating, a Chinese-based company called WH Group bought Smithfield for $7 billion. With this Smithfield purchase, the WH Group now owns one in four pigs raised in the United States. According to the Center for Investigative Reporting, which teamed up with PBS PBS to investigate this purchase, and I just read that they got an Emmy for this journalism, really amazing interactive journalism, and too many documentaries. 
Smithfield processes 32 million pigs a year. On average, one pig moves through a Smithfield Foods processing plant every second. One pig a second to be slaughtered, butchered, packaged, and shipped for consumption. So you've got bacon, ribs, and other pork cuts. The United States increasingly will become a large hog farm for the Chinese, this Chinese company, WH Group, with refrigerated shipping containers transporting frozen pig carcasses to China. So this globalized food system is complicating everything. I mean, you're killing an animal here, you're sending it to be processed in another country, packaged in another country, and then sent back to the United States. It just kind of make your head, it makes your head explode. I was actually reading in the Chronicle about how the salmon aren't doing well at all. And there was an interesting piece about, right, it was um, sardines. Unfortunately, there are not that many sardines in the ocean, and so a lot of animals are starving. Well, why is that? Because fishermen are catching sardines they're putting the sardines in blocked ice. They're sending them overseas to be fed to farmed fish that are then sent back to the United States, right? And so then you have the transportation, uh, the tra new trade deal, the TPP, which would make this all even worse. According to the Center for Investigative Reporting, China and the United States are about the same size geographically, about 3.7 million square miles, but China has more than four times as many people to feed, and it has less arable land than the United States. So moving toward a meat-centric diet has put a huge strain, as you can imagine, on China's agricultural system. Chinese farmers just cannot keep up with the demand. You're also seeing this in dry parts of the Middle East. Did you all read about the Saudi Arabian, a Saudi Arabian company, sometimes it's hard to get these names. They, the journalists often just say a Chinese company, a Saudi Arabian company. Well, can you be more specific? They came in to California and Arizona and bought a lot of land. And the farmers are growing alfalfa. And then they're sending the alfalfa, which is so water intensive, back to the Middle East to feed to their dairy cows. Because you think we're in a drought, parts of the Middle East have hardly any water. So there's just all these bizarre things that are happening so fast, and it's really hard to keep up with all of this. All right, so now let's talk about the manure. Studies show that this acquisition will increase the amount of hog manure in the United States. According to the Scientific American, at least 4.7 billion gallons of hog manure in the U.S. comes from Smithfield alone. 4.7 billion gallons of manure. The majority of hog feces from Smithfield sits in lagoons where it just sits and it ages for six to 12 months. And then all of it is sprayed on ag agricultural fields as fertilizer. So studies on the communities, mostly black and brown poor people, let's be honest, who live near these factories, find that individuals exposed to these orders and emissions from around the lagoons have more respiratory complaints and increased asthma symptoms. When pigs are raised in crowded environments, they require greater quantities of antibiotics to promote their growth and also to compensate for the unsanitary conditions. So the antibiotic use is linked with increased antibiotic resistance in humans, and this is actually getting quite a lot of attention in the media. So residents of Eastern North Carolina, where it's actually the area with the most Smithfield pigs, filed complaints against the company charging that the pollution from the production deprives them of the use and enjoyment of their property. Now, the Center for Investigative Reporting uncovered the fact that the WH Group, which owns Smithfield, lobbied the North Carolina government so hard that they prohibit the residents from using the name of the company in the lawsuit. Have any of you seen the documentary Speciesism? Okay. So that was a fantastic documentary, and the director, Mark DeVries, has been secretly using spy drones. So the drones are being used to capture animal agriculture, the good, the bad, and the very ugly. And it's amazing footage. There's orcas swimming with their moms, and then you get the manure pits. So he used spy drones to investigate and expose the devastation caused by these farms. And there's an amazing video on YouTube. It's basic. Have you seen this? It's basically like this massive pool of red. It's like this color. And it's the size of a football field. And it's just sitting there. 
And then there's footage of the hoses that spray it onto people's homes. And they interview these people who say that they have to shut their doors because it comes into their house. And they have to take the laundry off of the clotheslines. The good news is that that video has been viewed over four and a half million times on YouTube. And I just looked at the comment section this morning and 99% positive comments, which is so unusual on a lot of these videos. I mean, people are saying, this is outrageous. I mean, some people have said, I will never eat bacon again. So this is the kind of reaction that these videos are getting. It's, so it's a YouTube video. Uh, if you type in drones, factory farm, and pigs, you should find it. And the film is speciesism. Spe is that my saying? Speciesism? Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple other companies that are just really worth learning about. Um, Swift and Company is one of the leading beef and pork processors in the world today. It, a couple years ago, it purchased controlling interest in most of ConAgra's live animal operations. Uh, we've got Hormel Foods, Hormel reports annual revenues of about $4 billion, 16,000 employees. It's famous for its canned hams, its deli meats. It's the number one producer of whole and processed turkeys in the United States. It's got 140 breeding and grower farms, nine plants, including slaughterhouses. Altogether, Hormel produces more than a billion pounds of turkey every year. Sanderson Farms, I hadn't heard about Sanderson. It's the largest of the top six poultry only producers in the US, and they supply the US market with about a billion pounds of poultry every year, and they kill five and a half million birds every week. ConAgra reports revenue of about 20 billion a year with 63,000 employees, one of the country's largest packaged food companies. Now, I haven't been able to look this up, but I will at the end. A lot of these companies are realizing that vegetarian and vegan food is taking off, and they're starting to buy them. And so according to some of the reports I've read, ConAgra now owns uh, Light, Light Life, which is a vegetarian food company. ADM is a huge animal-based food company. They own Dean Foods, a major dairy producer, Silk, ConAgra, some parts of ConAgra. They've got beef, pork and chicken production, Light Life Brands, this is a con vegan convenience brand, Kraft. And then I really wanna do some more research on dairy because this is the other buzzword, right? The dairy industry, well, what is that? Yesterday I was driving to Sonoma County and I saw the clover ad of the cows doing yoga. <laughs> I, I mean, there's this, so clover's one that we all have heard of, especially if you grew up in California. I grew up in Petaluma, which used to be the dairy capital of the world, or one of them, at least in Northern California. I, I remember driving home, and I would always smell the manure. It's like, welcome home. It doesn't happen anymore because there's so much development there now, and a lot of the small farms have shut down. California is the number one dairy state in the country. There are 1.8 million head of cattle in California. Now, those of us who live in the Bay Area are kind of, we don't see this. If you drive down five, you see it, you smell it. It hits you in the face, right? Yeah, and Tracy. Right, the, the Central Valley. Uh, Wisconsin is number two with 1.3 million. So some of the California companies include Strauss and Foster Farms. And I think my next project is really going to look at the dairy industry and start naming names there because the dairy industry is so water intensive. And I'm really glad that Ben and Jerry's added coconut milk to, to two of their flavors, but why not every flavor? You can't even taste the difference, right? So. I feel like we celebrate, and I'm glad we do, when a company says, all right, two flavors are going to be vegan. We should say, thanks, but how about all of them? And maybe give them some information about how many cows are killed, how many babies are taken away from their moms. And sometimes people just don't think about it because they're set in their ways. So I think that's really, really important. It's also important to remember that companies care very deeply about their branding because of social media. That is the number one thing they care about. They don't like to be criticized. And because of social media, they really have no choice but to pay attention to all of you. Sometimes I will write a company and I'll say, I really like your jackets, but do you really have to use wool? And they'll write back. And they'll say, oh, well, we use sustainable wool. And then I'll write them back. And then they won't write back. But it's just good to get, it's good to get the dialogue going because a lot of them don't know. Even my local grocery store, I asked them to stop carrying Driscoll's 
because Driscoll's farm workers are on strike because they are paid horrible wages. And I just asked the fruit buyer, can you please look up information on Driscoll's? And he did. And the next time I went in there, there was no more Driscoll's. And I said, what happened? And he said, I looked it up. You're right. They are really exploiting their workers. And so I looked at, because Driscoll's really controls the berry market, and according to reports, they are going to move all of their processing to Mexico, where they don't have to abide by any environmental or labor laws. So they had these companies that I'd never heard of, and I said, I've never heard of this blueberry company. And he said, you know what's great about this? It's allowing us to buy from these small producers. They don't have a market in Whole Foods. They don't have a market in even some of the good co-ops. And so it's great because we're learning about these new companies and we're creating relationships. So then I wrote to those small companies and asked them how their workers are treated. And they wrote back immediately. They give you a website. I mean, you have no idea if they're telling the truth. But it's important to, for people, the companies, to know that you care about these issues because that's the only way that things will change. So you've got criticism, you have shaming, you have questions. And it is immediate, it is public, and it's permanent. So this is another reason we can talk about this during the Q&A, but you also have to think about, you know, do you want this permanently online? That's a really important consideration. So I have a couple examples of some success stories. In 2010, Greenpeace attacked Nestle with a viral video over its use of unsustainable palm oil. And after three months of being bombarded with Facebook posts, Nestle refused to budge. Well, they kept coming in. The post kept coming in the company finally agreed to cancel contracts with vendors who clear-cut rainforests to make room for palm oil plantations. Now, one of my favorite examples, it's kind of hot in here, is Blackfish. And uh, this is the documentary that told the story of Tilikum and SeaWorld. How many have seen Blackfish? Okay, it's an amazing documentary. If you have Netflix, you can stream it live. Okay, so this is, this is a great story. Blackfish was first in theaters in the summer of 2013. In October, just one month later, CNN decided to pick it up. And they played it over and over and over again. And as I like to say, the rest is history. There must be an orca lover or an animal lover in CNN's doc department because they played this in the middle of the night constantly. I mean, I was floored by how often they played this film. CNN, during one of the screenings, launched a Twitter conversation. One conversation and one screening led to 67,000 tweets, viewed by 7.3 million people. One tweet from, C this is CNN speaking, would you take your kids to SeaWorld? Reply now. Our debate on hashtag blackfish airs at 6.30 p.m. And they were bombarded. According to this website, Topsy, that keeps track of all these numbers, CNN Films, the Twitter handle, gained more followers after Blackfish than it had since its Twitter account launched in July 2013. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Mentions of Blackfish eclipsed the CNN handle, which is one of the biggest news accounts in the world. And I get chills because I remember this all playing out. And I would hear that Blackfish was going to be aired at 9 o'clock. And so I'd go on Twitter and I would just search hashtag Blackfish. And there were all these young girls who talk about fashion and makeup. I mean, they're not animal activists. And they're not political. And they, in the middle of the fashion and the makeup tweets, they would say, I just saw Blackfish. I'm never going to SeaWorld again. <laughs> and so I wrote to about 10 of these people who were tweeting. And I said, I'd like to interview you. I just wonder what got you. And about maybe eight wrote back. Most of them actually wrote back. And this one young woman said, so my mom was on this business trip and we were in a hotel and we were just flipping channels. We couldn't sleep. And we didn't really know much about Blackfish. We like SeaWorld. We go maybe once a year and we watched it and we were captivated. And she said, we'll never go again. And to me, that's so amazing because we're talking to people outside this room. I love talking to people inside the room, but I think it's also important to reach people who are blogging about fashion and makeup, right? So that was really amazing. And, oh yeah, and then Netflix added Blackfish, which increased its reach and doubled its audience. So, I mean, this is just powerful. Cowspiracy is another one produced by Leonardo DiCaprio, and this got a lot of attention also on Netflix. And they have a very, very active social media page. Blackfish has changed the game. In February, after SeaWorld saw its stock and its visitor numbers completely tank, SeaWorld had to admit 
that its employees posed as animal rights activists to spy on its critics. So according to reports, this is all out there for you to see. Paul McComb, the SeaWorld employee named by PETA, was placed on administrative leave during this internal probe. He is back at the company, though he's in a different department, I guess not the spy department. <laughs> PETA said that McComb, who used the name Thomas Jones while he infiltrated SeaWorld, posted inflammatory messages on social media, like burn SeaWorld to the ground, and drain the new tanks at SeaWorld. He urged other protesters to get a little aggressive to engage in direct action. Right? You know what that means. Also, SeaWorld says it plans to end its orca shows at its San Diego park by the end of this year. SeaWorld also says it will phase out its orca shows. Now, a lot of animal rights groups say that this does not go far enough, and they should release all of their orcas into sanctuaries. I mean, this the fact that this is getting attention is amazing. I, I was in Hawaii two years ago on the Big Island, and at the Hilton Hotel, they have a dolphin swimming program. And it's so sad. I mean, the pool is probably the size of this room. And they're so smart, though, because the dolphins are smiling constantly, right? And so they have people eating lunch right by the pool. And then the trainers give the dolphins fish, and they kiss, and they jump, and they look like they're having a ball. And so I asked some of the trainers what they thought about the claims in SeaWorld or the claims in the Cove, and what about the treatment of these animals? And they said, well, after Blackfish, we're actually seeing a lot of protests here, and we've really never seen that before. So it's having a major, major impact. A couple other examples, One Green Planet reports that a 2014 American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Chicago, at that meeting, a team of researchers from PETA and Western Governors University revealed that social media is drastically changing public opinion on animal testing. Uh, are you familiar with the Beagle Freedom Project? Yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, they're amazing. So sometimes, and we'll talk about this later, there's a, a hard question. Do you post the undercover horrific videos, or do you post the, the videos of these amazing dogs feeling grass for the first time and telling people on Facebook and Twitter that, yes, beagles are still tested on in the United States, which a lot of people don't know? I, I do both. I mean, it's all up to the individual. But I love that project, and I think they're amazing with social media. OK, and then the animal cruelty videos. I can't keep up with these things. They are happening almost every single week. And luckily, the media are really, they're, they're grabbing onto this, and they're playing these videos on the nightly news. OK, so this is why we're seeing all of these ag-gag laws passing across the country. These are the laws that criminalize whistleblowers who expose inhumane and cruel farming practices. And there are eight gag laws on the books, North Dakota, Montana, Kansas, Iowa, and North Carolina. And the outrage over these videos by animal activists are really making a difference because I just found this website today called Modern Farmer, and they talk about backyard chickens and things like that. And they actually posted a study that says ag-gag laws are eroding trust in farmers because it's getting so much attention. All right, so here's the good news. Well, that, that a lot of this is really good news, but... Just in April and March, there, here are some mainstream headlines. I'm not going to One Green Planet or any of the veggie or animal rights activist sites. Okay, USA Today, why going vegan for Mother Earth can have a huge impact. The Guardian, New Crop, the Vegan Venture Fund fighting for animal rights. The Appalachian Online, why veganism is the way to go. The Appalachian Online, that's pretty neat. Uh, Grist, these delicious veggie burgers are fighting climate change. Forbes, New York restaurateur goes vegan. Can he turn a profit and satisfy his conscience? Reuters. This is in every newspaper across the country. Vegan eating would slash foods global warming emissions, according to a study. Time magazine. How a vegetarian diet could help save the planet. I mean, this is just, it's incredible to see. And the industry is frightened of this. Because I also checked out Beef Magazine. Here are a couple headlines at beefmagazine.com. Why the idea of vegan butcher shop is ridiculous. There's a vegan butcher shop now in Berkeley, by the way. Yeah, it's really, really good. And I usually don't eat fake meats, but I, I decided to try it, and it's amazing. OK, here's a couple other headlines. New study shows vegans are unhappy and sick more often. <laughs> you all look really happy and really healthy. I got like five hours of sleep last night, and here we are today. OK, has the anti-livestock camp gone too far? OK, but this one is my favorite. And I didn't click on it, so I don't know if it's true. 
Hunger Games, Jennifer Lawrence, no fan of PETA. I mean, all right, so the question here is, what is most effective? The undercover videos, or I love going to the gentle barn and the farm sanctuaries and posting photos of pigs who are happy. And, and it's so interesting because I have some friends who said, it was your posts about water and beef that got me to stop eating beef. Another friend said, it was the undercover video. I looked in their eyes and I can never eat meat again. Uh, another friend said, it was the documentaries that you posted. I watched them and I'll never eat this again. So it's everybody's completely different. I would say just test it and see what works for you. But I do posts probably twice a day. In the morning, I do a good morning and I post a happy pig. And then in the middle of the day, I'll do something like, Con Agra kills 188,000 pigs a day. How is this possible? And then I'll put something about Con Agra or Tyson. So it really is up to your specific preference. And do we have five minutes also for questions? Just five minutes? Oh, wow, okay, so this, this went by really fast. Um, so I would encourage you all to get involved with media. Call into radio shows. If you hear a story about these issues, like NPR, for example, you can put a comment at their, their website and people read it. That is really, really effective. Um, I also look at, you know, if something comes up in my feed about how humane chicken is the way to go, I will post something and say, oh, but did you know about this? and then put a link, and then they can decide for themselves. So I would say that the data is on our side. I mean, really, look at these numbers. And when people are exposed to information, I really believe they take action. And I wish that we had time for more questions, but let's just take a few. And I'd love to know what you think about naming Big Ag. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've been a journalist since 1995, and I don't think anyone can question my facts. Clearly, I have a lot of biases. I think, frankly, I think if reporters came out with their biases, we may, might have a more informed public because people go to great lengths to be balanced. But for the climate change debate, for example, I don't think any denier deserves airtime. They're funded by the oil industry. Um, and I will have debates on my show, and no one can say that I'm not being fair. You know, sometimes we have both sides, sometimes we don't. I mean, we are, by default, we have no qualms about saying we're a progressive radio, uh, progressive radio show. So that's just how I see it. I've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm happy to give all of my sources. We call industry a lot, and we want them to come on and talk, and more, most of the time they, they, they decline our invitations. Thank you. I'm sorry, the oh, yes. It's your call radio on KALW, 10 to 11 AM every day. Yes. And tomorrow, we're having two of the Goldman Environmental Prize winners on who are doing amazing work. Any other questions or comments? Do you have a podcast? Yes. If you go to yourcallradio.org, you can find it. Thank you. Yes. You know, something about animal rights. Right. And, you know, all my animal rights followers will then be mm -hmm. the ones who comment. So do you have, in your radio show or in your social media or anything, do you have sort of an action piece to it? Because for me, I found that what I'd like to know is, okay, you know, we're preaching to the choir, so now what can we do to disseminate it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one. We never end a show without talking about solutions and trying to let people know where they can get more information. Uh, but I would say like, it's, a, it's a tough call. I mean, I think it's important to maybe go on other conversations, like find a post about something that maybe you disagree with, whether it's about the meat or the dairy industries, or, oh, there's this new great bacon shop in San Francisco. I mean, they're opening every week, right? There's some new sh restaurant that has hardly any vegetarian options. So maybe you go over there instead, and that's how you spend your 10 minutes that day, and say, hey, what about vegetarianism? Or did you know that th th this many thousands, hundreds of thousands of pigs are killed every year? Do you really need that on your menu? I mean, I think that is really, really effective. Because you really can change companies. Especially the smaller ones. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that, for me, it's a, it's a good use of time to go over there and, you know, be kind so they don't delete you. But just 
Hey, did you know this happened? There are so many alternatives out there. Why not try them? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, big fan of the show. Thank you. Mm. And a lot of people don't know. They're our neighbors. They're down the street, and they do lab testing on beetles that are in their cages 24-7 that are treated with no humanity or kindness. It's horrible conditions. They're right here. Mm. Yeah, I've seen a few protests around some of the local groups, the colleges and that kind of thing. But I think for something like that, that would be a great radio show. And so you could, you could pitch it. I mean, unfortunately, our media is diminishing in, in the Bay Area. I don't know if you heard, but at KGO Radio, their entire newsroom was laid off, fired, sorry, about two weeks ago. I mean, that, this is a major source of news in the Bay Area. So I would say contact KQED, KPFA, KALW, San Francisco Chronicle. That's another good use of your time. We all have emails and social media, and we all answer them and read them. And it's a, so say, hi, hey, but how about doing a show about this? Writing an op-ed, very effective. Letter to the editor, it's all really, really effective. Yes. Thank you all so much. And uh, name the names. <laughs>